This is the Illegitimate Scholar Podcast, the podcast for humans, not limited by mainstream academia. I'm Sam, and I quit teaching history because I love the content, but hated the limits on what and how I could teach. In this podcast, you'll hear stories in history, anthropology, culture, and geopolitics that make you rethink what you were taught in school. And today, we are going to talk about stories and cultural myths and how those reflect the culture that uh, created them. So we're going to talk about uh, a, a few different stories, and at the end, we're going to talk about our stories in modern Western and American culture. There's things like origin stories uh, for Abrahamic religions like Judaism, Christianity, Islam, Druze. This is Revelations. This is the origin story for uh, Christianity and these other religions. Uh, the Haudenosaunee, which we talked about before, the Iroquois, um, they have an origin story that involves North America or the Earth being on the back of a turtle. And that's true of a lot of other Northeastern Native Americans. Oftentimes, these stories, they reflect people's environment. So uh, pre-Abrahamic religions would have had origin stories, and, and they do. Um, indigenous Europeans have different origin stories that reflect their uh, more primitive technology and everything. Uh, more primitive. That's that's not a word that people like to use, but sometimes primitive, not necessarily being a bad thing, it just means less complex. The origin story of the Aztecs is not the same as the origin story of the Northeastern Native Americans, because Northeastern Native Americans had a much smaller level of political organization than an empire like the Aztecs, or whatever you want to call it. Revelations tells of this one god, which is from monotheism, and things like the Big Bang, while reflective of science, are like, you know, we're not really sure that's how it happened. Even scientists aren't. But that is reflective of our culture. That's an origin story that's reflective of our culture. As well as there's other origin stories, like origin stories of America and things like that. There's also stories of heroes um, and stories of villains. And these stories in different cultures, they show what traits a culture wants to promote and what traits they view as bad. And this has the effect through metaphor of when young people, old people, whoever is reading or listening or hearing these stories, they are subconsciously being told through myth what traits that they should aspire to be. There's a ton of different ways that these stories can be told. The way the story is told, the, the actual format of the story is even reflected in what that culture has. So if, if a culture doesn't have writing, they're obviously not going to have written down stories. They're going to have oral traditions. Cave people use cave paintings. There's uh, some evidence that people think that they used fire to tell stories with the cave paintings and you know manipulating light to to move the figures anthropologists have done studies on this romans had plays in person you know romans have plays up on stages with big amphitheaters they're very famous uh greeks did as well they also romans and greeks had these epic stories that are written down you can also find those in places like Scandinavia and into Iceland, which is Scandinavian diaspora. Things like indigenous people having origin stories and, and myths that are often oral traditions because at the point when people settle down, they kind of, even if they're the same people, they kind of stop being referred to as indigenous. We'll probably go into that later, but it's kind of a weird term. Um, you know, do the best we can. So what is valued by a society will be expressed in these stories, often the ideal for that society. So like George Washington and the cherry tree, I cannot tell a lie. We're not really sure if this happened, probably not, but it's an origin story that involves a real person. George Washington chops down a cherry tree. I cannot tell a lie. I did it. This story shows how honest George Washington is. And then we also have Abraham Lincoln, also a revered president who was called Honest Abe. Honesty is something that we value in American culture, um, in theory. Looking at you, Nancy Pelosi. Spartan children, conversely, against this, they were taught to lie and steal and deny and not get caught. This was something that they liked in their society. This is something that, this was a trait that they, they wanted to do. There's a story about a Spartan boy who stole a fox. And he stole a fox because Spartan children, as they were learning to be warriors, they were purposely starved so that they had to steal. They had to figure it out. They had to figure out how to get what they needed. And so this kid steals a fox, just denies it till the end. He's hiding the fox under his shirt. As he's being accused of stealing by this older Spartan person, the fox is eating his insides and he drops dead. He denied it to the very last moment. And this is 
told as a story to young Spartan children as how they should be virtuous. They should be lying and stealing and denying and trying to get whatever they can. And I assume this promotes in Spartan society the idea of being very resourceful. So examples of cultural stories and what they tell us. We're going to talk about a few examples today. Um, so we're going to start with one of my favorite cultures to learn about, uh, near to my heart, because this is a people of the sea. Uh, and as both a New Englander and a Marine, I am amphibious, and I love learning about other sea-based cultures. And I would say the number one sea-based culture, it's not the Spanish Armada, it's not the Portuguese, it's not the English, it's the Polynesians. Okay, the Polynesians living in Hawaii, like, Hawaii, Tahiti, New Zealand, all these different places. They really, really spread out, spread so far out in like this vast ocean. Okay, so Polynesian culture is vast and diverse because it's over a long period. So what you often have and what you have in this case is differences in the origin story as it spreads out and as these cultures change. So the Maori in New Zealand, they have a different origin story than the, um, than the people in Hawaii. And they are similar and they, they're based in the same thing, just like the gods of the Norse were based in Indo-European gods, proto-Indo-European gods, just like the Greek gods were. But they changed over time in relation to this new culture. And you can even see this on, on smaller levels. But um, yeah, so Maui. Uh, he was a demigod. He was strong. He was a trickster, you know, a trickster like Loki or... Um, just like Prometheus, he stole fire and gave it to humans. This is a thing that Maui did and why he's revered. And unlike in Disney's Moana, which is something that I, it, it's a story I really love, he's assisted by a goddess by the name of Hina. She's missing in the movie. I assume it's because they already had Moana as the female lead and they didn't want to complicate it. But that's what happens in stories like Moana when they're being retold. And changed again. As I'm reading about this, there were some Polynesian people who were not happy about the portrayal of Moana for a number of different reasons. I totally get that, you know, totally reasonable. But in any adaption of the story, somebody's going to be offended. I'm not disregarding that, but I'm I'm saying that like it's it is inevitable. So you know, it's good to at least get an idea for what the criticisms are and why, because in those criticisms of that movie, I'm not saying don't make Moana. I mean, please continue to make Moana. But at the same time, it's in those criticisms by these specific people, you can find more truth about that society and um, about that culture. So Togan cultural anthropologist, Toga is a Polynesian people. I hope I do this name right. Uh, Tevita o Kaili. In Polynesian lores, the association of a powerful goddess with a mighty god creates a symmetry which gives rise to harmony and above all beauty in the stories. Maui is assisted by Hina. Hina is the goddess that is with Maui, who's the god, the demigod. This creation myth, which with Hina being involved, it shows the value of men as well as women as a cultural trait. One of the stories about Maui is he has this magical fish hook, just like in Moana, and he pulls the islands out of the sea with it while his brothers are uh, paddling and he's telling them it's a fish and they shouldn't look back. And one of the brothers looks back and sees it's an island. And there would have been more islands in this myth, but because the brother looked back, there were fewer islands. There was just what had already been pulled out, which I don't know what that tells you, but it tells you something. This story where these guys are paddling and they trust their brother to just keep paddling and not look back, one of them eventually looks back, which he shouldn't have done. And there would have been more islands if he didn't do that. So this is a trait that they're discouraging. But the guys that are, they're paddling, they're paddling really hard and they get tired and they keep paddling. They're promoting the strength and resilience in this theme of uh, the water, the sea, which is so common in Polynesian culture. It's how it's what it's based on. They use the themes and the geography of, of what they interact with. So he pulls with a fish hook these islands out of the sea and gets all the islands of Polynesia. And because of the strength and the resilience and like the, the perseverance of these people who kept rowing. Because that's what's required when you live in the middle of the ocean and you're trying to find new islands. It's hard to do. If you look back, I guess that's what it is. Like if you commit to go find a new island, you can't look back. Okay, because that's like you're in the middle of the ocean. You need to find someplace. I guess you might have plans to turn back eventually. They were very advanced navigators with methods that we don't even understand today. Um, they would have to be to do what they did. But that story tells about what should be promoted in these societies, in any society. Maui died by being crushed by the obsidian teeth 
in the vagina of a different goddess. I'm not making this up. I, I read this. I, maybe it's not true in every story. So if, if there's any Polynesians listening to my podcast, which I would be thrilled about, please just let me know um, and keep listening to my podcast. Don't stop because I would love to talk to you. Maui dies by being crushed in the teeth of another goddess, which promotes the cultural idea of not trusting women. I'm just kidding. I don't know if it does that, but all I'm saying is that it reminds me of the Greeks again because that seems pretty gay because it seems like they're discouraging. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Greeks are cool. Polynesians are cool, but like, yeah, there might be fucking teeth in there, dude. You might as well just date a guy. That's what I would do. Vagina teeth. Why is teeth and vagina a common thread across cultures? I got to look into that. Um, okay. The Iliad, ancient Greek story, promotes this warrior culture that is personified in Achilles, this great warrior. You would have seen it in Troy, probably. It's a, it's a story that uh, I think the movie was made in the 90s. Great movie. So I'm going to read a quote from Achilles. Such was I, as I lay through all the many nights unsleeping, such as I wore through the bloody days of fighting, striving with warriors for the sake of these men's women. These men's women is an apostrophe. The women that belong to the men in a sentence structure sense, but also probably in this sense, just like as property at this time, whatever. Um, but I say that I have stormed from my ships 12 cities of men and by land 11 more. So it promotes the idea of men being protectors of women. This is one of the things that he says that with warriors for the sake of these men's, like his men, warriors for the sake of their women, um, because whatever you're getting, I guess you're getting it for the women. It's about men providing for women. That's a value that's being promoted in this. Um, and storming many of these cities, 12 cities by sea, 11 by land. Maybe those numbers have some sort of metaphorical significance that I'm not familiar with. Probably they usually do, but that's a lot of cities to attack. And it's like, this is a great warrior. He's attacking all the time and conquering more places. And these are traits that are promoted. Agamemnon takes away a prize from Achilles that he had gotten for capturing a city. And Achilles is upset by this and stops fighting with Agamemnon. And eventually Agamemnon offers him all these gifts. Agamemnon offers Achilles a ton of gifts, seven fortresses, and um, to marry Agamemnon's daughter. And this is a huge, generous offer. Seven, city, seven fortresses, seven big strongholds, uh, a daughter, and a bunch of other gifts. Like, this is a massive gift. And again, promoting this idea of not taking promoting this new idea of not taking from other people not being like the size of this gift would effectively make achilles a vassal of agamemnon because it was provided by agamemnon and to promote his individuality this comes out of like the city states period in greece where they're not joining the persian empire promoting this idea of individuality achilles says no i'm not going to take all of these gifts these golden handcuffs you know of giving him all these things but forcing him to be subordinate to Agamemnon. And then uh, Mulan. We're going to talk about Mulan. This is a real story from the Wei dynasty in China, and it comes from a short poem, and then more stuff was created over time. And this is about a woman, fictional or real, who fought Mongolians, just like many other Chinese fought Mongolians. You know, oh, I hate the Mongolians. Am I allowed to do that? South Park's allowed to do it. I'm going to do it. That's fine. Yeah, Mongolians always trying to break down a shitty wall. Mongolians were always trying to come into China and break down the shitty wall. And sometimes they were successful, to be honest. And what would happen is the steppe peoples from Mongolia would come in and oftentimes they would take over the Chinese kingdom and they would become settled peoples. And often they would assimilate into the Han Chinese culture. And actually Mulan is one of these cases because the story of Mulan as a heroine, as a hero, a female hero, comes from uh, Xiang Bai. Xiang Bai. Xiang Bai. I think I'm right. I hope I'm right. Xiang Bai, which was a semi-nomadic people who had settled in and taken over as one of the dynasties of China. They joined the, the Han Chinese culture. So while Mulan, as a story, comes from a nomadic people, which makes sense because that's what the origin is of the story. That's what the origin of the uh, the rulers of that dynasty were. Eventually, and especially in the modern adaption of it, both of them, Mulan is shown as uh, a Han Chinese noblewoman's daughter. It makes sense that the origin is in nomads because nomads traditionally, in almost all cases, are more egalitarian than settled peoples. And especially in China, 
which was based in the Confucian ethic and still largely is. This is a big contributor to China. Confucianism is very patriarchal. It's based in men leading it. Okay, So in Confucianism, the father is above the mother. And in, in nomadic tribes, it, this was less true, and this is generally less true in more traditional societies. It, it's not that there isn't a division of labor between in hunter-gatherers or nomadic peoples. There is a division of labor, but there's um, there's less there there's an understanding of the value of men and women's roles in these societies. And clearly, this story is a nomadic story of a woman who, based on a specific need, based on this specific situation which is when her father um, cannot go fight, she goes and fights in his place. So based on this need, this woman, and this is encouraged because she's a hero, she's a heroine, she joins um, the army fighting as a man for her father, which, and these are traits that are viewed as virtuous, right? And then eventually it gets adopted into the Han Chinese culture. So it's Mulan then, who is now a Han Chinese noblewoman, but she's still serving her father, which, you know, does fit into Confucian tradition. And this story also comes out of this time. There are many times in China, the Warring States, 16 Kingdoms, Three Kingdoms, Northern and Southern Dynasties, which I think was around this time, where China is split up into multiple kingdoms and is then returned to one unified state. The most recent of these would probably be like the 19th century with the weakness of uh, the Qing dynasty and the breakup into the Republic. Whatever, I digress. So this has happened a lot. So this is a theme in China. So these times, which sometimes last hundreds of years, are considered very tumultuous. And it would require um, personal sacrifice of people who wouldn't normally have to do it, in this case, a woman. And it also promotes, like this, this is a story that promotes women's empowerment so all of these stories, like I mentioned, have been adapted into Western cultural movies. They were chosen for their traits by Western um, audiences. They were, they were chosen by their, their specific traits they had already for Western audiences. And then they were changed a little bit more to fit Western audiences and other people. And also the, the thoughts of the people that were making them. So the original Mulan... In the 90s, the animated one, it had Mushu the dragon, who was like a funny character. And they Disney decided that they were, for the live action adaption, they were going to remove Mushu. And they made it a little bit more serious. And this actually wasn't for Western audiences. This was for Chinese audiences that they were trying to sell to. And in, in Moana, details are changed, like the omission of Hina, the goddess. Uh, and these stories change over time. Anyway, they, they change regardless. I've mentioned this before, but these stories, whether they're in their native culture or not, they change over time and they diffuse, which means that, you know, there's a, the same people. They split up into two villages in Papua New Guinea, the Amazon, wherever they are, Celtic Britain. And then based on the structure of those two places, as they split up over time, maybe one of them goes to the mountains and one of them stays in the forest or something like that then they are going to then change their culture. They're going to change their stories to fit their new environment. And they might adopt a totally new one, but generally they'll just change it over time. They'll tweak it based on the new values that they want to be promoting, what their goal is. So in this case, in the 90s, Mulan was made largely for an American audience. The live action one was made for both an American audience and a Chinese audience, which requires it to hold different values and include different things. The original story of Mulan is goes from being a nomadic people story. It's then adopted by the greater Chinese culture. Then it's adopted for American audiences in the 90s, which is largely a, a white diaspora, European diaspora-based time, but it had plenty of influences for minorities. And then today in the 2020s, it's a globalist thing that's for the whole world, including China. So they, they all were made for different reasons and changed as a result of those reasons. They changed to reflect their culture. I mean, I'm not saying that's good or bad in any case. It's just what happens. So today there's a lot of stories about what, there's a lot of discussion about what stories we tell. You can call it culture war bullshit, and it kind of is, and I tend to try to stay away from that. But in this case, it does have a real value to it because the stories that we tell, the metaphors that we tell in our society, they matter. They really, really matter because it's it's the metaphors that you consume. You're watching things. Certain traits are promoted. Certain traits are, are shown as being not good. Some are virtuous. And it, it matters. It, it really does. And it also shows what people's values are. And sometimes the people creating the stories, their values don't mesh with the people actually watching them. You can see that sometimes. 
but a lot of times they do, and they at least represent something. So the stories that we're telling, even if they're created by large studios like Disney or whoever made Troy, they're still reflective of the society they're in. And I think people have a disconnection because it's not like an oral tradition being told by a fire. That doesn't mean that it's not reflective of the culture that it's made in. In American culture, yeah, there's campfire stories, sure. There's plenty of like folk American stories, which were then adapted into different things later as we get more technology. But there's also like as a country of over 300 million people and now multiple cultures, what like them being told on this big Hollywood screen, like that's American culture. That is the thing that people associate the most with American culture, I bet, internationally is Hollywood. So when people see Hollywood, that's American culture. And when people from abroad see American movies, especially when those American movies were made more for American audiences in the 90s versus today, when it's a little bit more globalist, international, then that's exporting American culture. That's exporting American values because they see these movies. They see the values that we have. They see like Rambo and shit, right? It's all, it's all American culture. And that exports it overseas when other people see that and it affects them. And cultures can be very powerful. People adopt the culture of other people. And that doesn't mean totally adopting that culture, but capitalism is largely a Western invention. Like uh, the specific type of capitalism that has gone global is was created in the United States based on European methods. And that has been exported globally to, to great success of many people. Like in Singapore, one of the biggest banking capitals of the world, they adopted an American style of uh, economics, but it's still a, a multi-ethnic Malaysian uh, Han Chinese state that is largely a Confucian state as well. It's a very, very legalistic place. Uh, legalism being an ancient Chinese philosophy that we'll go into later. It also matters who tells these stories, okay? So representation is a big topic of discussion. There seems to be a cultural attack on redheads. It seems like every character that they take from a white character to a black character isn't just some random white guy. It's a redhead. But representation is a big topic. Sex, uh, race, religion, I guess redheads don't matter. Maybe that's maybe that's something. Maybe there's someone high up in Hollywood who just hates redheads. He got his heart broke by a redhead woman, and now he's just, you know what? All those redhead women. Annie, black. Little Mermaid, black. No more redheads. We're not doing it. He can't stand to see it. That's what I would do. If I had the story. So let's talk about the Black Little Mermaid. And this is Culture War BS. But again, the stories that we tell matter. Okay. Black Little Mermaid. Little Mermaid is a Danish story. Okay. It's a Danish story. It comes from Denmark in the 1830s. Something like that. By our current logic in American society, it's okay for a black person to play this character that would have traditionally been white. And I'm not passing judgment on that. I'm saying that that's what it is. And that's shown because that's what happened. So in our current culture, at least from the elite, that is something that's okay. Um, I don't care, personally. I know some of you probably do, but I, I just want to talk about it. I want to examine this. So you can have a white character played by a black person, but you can't have the reverse. Let's just get that out of the way. That's, that's pretty much unacceptable. Um, but people seem to ignore, and like I haven't seen anyone talk about the fact that this is a Danish story. It's not... A white story like just the concept of of having white black asian hispanic like that's an american invention people wouldn't have thought like that even 150 years ago in american this is a strictly modern way of thinking so what i want to know is like l let's talk about how it would have been okay for a white person like what an irish person a greek person playing the little mermaid would that have been better than a black person i mean it's still someone from a different culture but at the same time, it, it, it first was a Danish story. It was adopted into white American culture, what you could call it back like the Little Mermaid in the 90s, white American culture, maybe starting to be more multicultural. It's the 90s. It's not the 50s. But it, it, it then is is a white character because that's the way we think about race in America. And But the story being changed as it responds to a changing environment is is completely normal. So it became it, it was Danish, became American and like white American, and now it's being played by a black person. That's that's just what happened. That's that's what's happening. And this is common over time. I talked about Mulan before, how Mulan changed from being a nomad story to a Han Chinese story because these nomads assimilated into Han society rather than the other way around. When nomads would attack settled peoples and take them over, usually what they would do is eventually they would just adopt the culture of the people 
that they had conquered, especially because they generally had less people. And th this is common in a, a lot of places where an upper class comes in and they alter the culture a little bit, but they leave most things intact because that's kind of, that's how you rule is by not changing all that much. Th this happens all the time. Like the, the Romans adopted the Egyptian tax system. They didn't try to put their own in. Um, but this like nomad story to Han Chinese to American story told like from a Chinese perspective ish by like American producers. And then, you know, it changed again. So some people view this though, as like a black person taking over white culture, like playing the role for a white person in that, like, oh no, like white culture isn't being defended or, or whatever, or like, it's like black people appropriating white culture. And so this, this black girl playing this white American character, even though originally it's Danish is seen as a problem to some people. Sorry if I'm misrepresenting anyone's ideas. Let me know if you have a different perspective on this, but I actually think it's the opposite. Of this I think it's I, I take like actually the complete opposite perspective because the Little Mermaid was created in Denmark in the early 1800s uh, like many fairy tales at the time it was a lot darker and more violent than the version that was created by Hollywood which makes sense because it was adopted for the very violent 1800s versus post-world war ii America which is a very peaceful time relatively so the story was appropriated and changed by Disney. This was literal cultural appropriation, which is a dirty word, but it's a term in anthropology that just means adoption, which is what people do with culture. I mean, Muslims didn't even make Mecca. The Kiba, which is the, the place in Mecca that Muslims uh, revere the most, um, and I'm not saying this is wrong, it was, it was a pre-Islamic thing. It existed prior to Islam, and it was appropriated by Islam. Um, just like this Danish story was pr appropriated by Disney. And it was changed for an American audience. And it changed again recently with this new live action adaption, just like The Little Mermaid did in more ways than just it being a black girl. There was other, I mean, I didn't see the movie, so I don't know, but th I'm sure there were changes in it. So this is a European story in origin created by mostly white producers for a diverse American population. The only thing black about it is the actor. And I see this not as a white story, being stolen by black people or or whatever the argument is it's it's honestly it is a white european story it's white if you believe in that if if that's the way that you think about race it's a white story that they are putting a black face on so really w what's happening is the black people are be are being assimilated into these white stories okay i see it as being like changing ad as an anno domini year of our Lord to common era CE, but still using the same date. Like, yeah, it's the common era. What makes it so common? What's common about it? Is it the fact that Jesus rose from the dead? Is that it? No. Oh, but it's the same year. Just coincidentally, you just landed on the same time. Listen, if you want to start a new calendar from the civil rights act or something like that and make it year, what, whatever, 1967, you want to make it 55 years or whatever. You want to make it year 55. I'm cool with that. But the idea that you're just going to take something that already exists and was made in a certain way and has origins in something else, and then you're just going to give it a paint job, like that's effectively what that is. So same thing with The Lion King. The, the Lion King and the modern adaption, both of them, like they're told it's a story in Africa. And it does actually, I looked this up, I didn't know this, but it does have some African story influences to it. But largely it's just Hamlet which is a European story that's rooted in older European stuff, okay? So it's like, it's it's still a European story, even though the live action was all black people. And putting all those black people in that movie, which is fine, I don't care, it's, it's again, it's putting a black face onto what essentially is a white European cultural story. And that has the effect, it's the opposite. It's It's black people assimilating into white culture, not white culture being appropriated by black people or black culture being given a more prominent role. I mean, especially since most of the directors and everything of that stuff, most of the people working on it, creating it, they're white, Jewish, white, whatever. Okay. Um, I'm not saying Jews run Hollywood. Okay. I'm not saying Kyle runs Hollywood. I'm not. 
And there's a number of reasons for this, okay? So it's easier and cheaper to retell a story that's been told and is already popular and is tied to greater Disney products like an amusement park. They release Little Mermaid. They have rides and products for The Little Mermaid already. It's cheaper for them to produce it and it's intellectual property that people recognize so they're going to go see it, which is great if you're trying to make money, which ultimately is the goal of a corporation. See episode 17 on corporations. I think 17 is one of my favorites that I've done. Um, it's very important. You need to understand what corporations role is in society. And it really comes down to making fucking money. And that's it. Everything else doesn't matter, even human suffering. So what I would prefer as someone who loves culture, loves diverse culture, loves different stories, loves the human species and everything that it produces, not everything, a lot of it sucks. But what I would love is is for new stories to be told, right? And, and that could mean that like, maybe have a white girl play Ariel and then tell a story from Africa, use black actors for that, or don't, I don't care. I wouldn't care if they were using white actors in a story based in Africa and they were using black actors in a story based in America. I don't care. It's acting. Okay. I don't give a shit. I just like to enjoy media. I really do. But I would really love to see more diverse stories told. And you see this sometimes, obviously Moana, Mulan, these are stories that are, that are from other cultures generally. And I think that's great, but we don't see it that much. And again, there's another reasons for this. And this is honestly part of a greater thing of them just rehashing old stories because of the name recognition and everything. It's just easier to sell stuff that way. And that's ultimately what they care about. But there is like if they really cared about representation, there's all of these stories from all these different cultures in uh, Native America, you know, indigenous stories from uh, from America, First Nations in Canada, Latin America, all these diverse indigenous cultures, all of these different cultures in Africa that has more ethnic diversity than anywhere else on Earth because the humans evolved there. And I think that would be great. And it would it would add new uh, characters, new cultures, new stories. And I would I would personally enjoy that very much. And I would consume that product. Unfortunately, from evidence, because they do this sometimes, that's not really the case. One of my favorite movies. I love animated movies. One of my favorites of the last few years, and I, I hope you've seen it. Uh, Raya and the Last Dragon. This is a story that it comes from Southeast Asia, and it's an amazing performance by Aquafina, who's one of my favorites. She was in Crazy Rich Asians, Nora from Queens, or Aquafina is Nora from Queens. Love Aquafina, Shang Chi, amazing. She does a great job. She's one of my. F Seriously, I can't say enough. Great. I'm literally going to spend 20 seconds just telling you how much I love Aquafina. I think she's terrific. Um, Aquafina, please notice me. Yeah. So. It was amazing. I've seen it like five times. I love that movie. It's on Disney Plus. And that, you know, part of this could be because it was during the pandemic, but it had a box office of 130 million versus 100 million plus budget. So that sucks. Didn't do very well. You also might have seen the movie Soul. I didn't like this one as much, but I enjoyed it. I, I really loved Ryan the Last Dragon. I liked Soul, but um, this was a black jazz musician. It was a story about him, and it was a very all-black movie. And it was a new story, and it was great. And it was a really nice story that was told. It's got a 95% critic rating on Rotten Tomato, and more importantly, an 88% audience rating. It is a very highly liked movie. It's very rare for a movie to get that high of both a critic and an audience rating. That means 88% of the audience that watched it liked it. That's great. That's awesome. Great movie. It really was. Really well done. Great music. And it lost... $50 million at the box office. And it was really popular in like Russia and Ukraine for some reason uh, and China. But it, it nobody watched it. The people that did watch it loved it, but nobody watched it. And so why would they make new stories when they have the old stories? And if they want to do representation, they want to be seen as being woke, take a black face, slap it on a white story. And look, I, I'm not, I love white people. I love black people. I love everybody. Okay, that's the point here. That's what this show is about. The show is about being human. And I love the spectrum of the human experience. Okay, I really do. I know I've said some things that some people are going to call me woke in this episode and some people are going to call me racist on the other side. I can't win. Okay, look, I, I'm politically independent. I just, I'm, I'm sharing my thoughts on cultural stories. I think these are very important. And I think there is a lot to be said about what stories we tell, what they push, and like what is the reasoning behind what stories we tell. Because it didn't used to be profit, right? Not like in the past, it, their stories often are told maybe to keep the, the lower class down, which is something I might address later, but not in this episode. 
but like for profit, especially when it's being told for an audience outside the United States, like in China with the live action Mulan, it's a little scary, especially when you consider how powerful American culture is supposed to be. Um, but regardless, look, if you take one thing away from this episode, just consider what you're watching, consider what that content through metaphors and through stories is uh, promoting versus the opposite of promoting, whatever that means, um, and, and what its origins are. And you can look this stuff up, you know? Yeah, I'm gonna go catch a flight later.